welcome again to Shift Remote. This is the fourth in our 12-part series where we bring together the brightest developers on my, online for you, our incredible audience. Now, today we're diving particularly into the topic of the web, and that's why you're here. Um, and I'll just run you through how this will work. So I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, my name's Bilal, not that you care. All that means is that I'll be popping up every now and then to introduce our next speaker. Um, you may have noticed that we have a chat section there on the right and a comment section there below. We love it when you stay in touch with us. So get in touch, use the chat, tell us where you are in the world, tell us what you're doing and use that comment section there if you've got any questions and our team behind the scenes will pick those up for you. Some of those we'll be able to use at particular points for our live Q&A Others of them will try and pick up and get back to you where possible. Um, so as I said, this is the fourth in our 12 part series. You may know that we've got another one coming up on the 16th. So please do register for that if you haven't already. Uh, as always with our conferences, we like it when you use social media. Please use the hashtag shift remote for anything social and therefore we'll be able to see where you are and what you've thought about our conference. Hopefully it is all Good stuff. Now, before we get cracking with our conference, as ever, I'd love to say a huge thank you to the people who've made this possible, our incredible sponsors. So first off, thank you to Microsoft and Infobit, also to Autodesk, Microblink, Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT Japania, Venture, Pseudocode 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinium, Q, Nine Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy, and Neto Krasher. Thank you so much. Without you, none of this would be possible. So to start then, I'm going to hand over to the man who's made this all possible, Ivan Burazin. And we're back with event number four of the Virtual Developer Shift Remote Series. Well, that was a mouthful. Anyway, this is event number four of 12. So going through them pretty fast. We have one more this week, then the, then the team takes a two week break and we're back for two more. Um, anyway, the theme today is web. So uh, we have uh, four amazing speakers, uh, Ada from Samsung, Patrick from Facebook, um, and they have a lot to share with you today. I hope you do enjoy the event and do remember we are doing our shift in person event. Although this year it may be a bit different, we are planning to do a open air uh, event, more festival style, uh, a lot of space between the people, so a lot of fresh air. Uh, so check it out, more info on the web next week and also we will be sending you uh, more stuff out via our newsletter. In any case, enjoy the event and see you soon. Okay, thank you so much for that, Ivan. Which brings us to our first speaker. Now, they've been working on web performance in one form or another for the last 20 years and are currently working on web performance at Facebook. Prior to that, they worked at Cloudflare and Google to make Chrome and the web faster. They created the popular open source web page test web performance measurement tool and runs the free instance of it at webpagetest.org. We're in for a treat and after this there will also be a live Q&A so please do get your questions in that comment section. Let's welcome Patrick Meenan. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining. Um, Pat Meenan, uh, I currently work at Facebook. Um, before that, Cloudflare, uh, Google, I uh, run web page test, um, basically look a lot of web performance um, basically every day. And what I wanted to talk to you about today is resource prioritization, uh, where we stand, uh, what you can do about it, and mostly why it matters and why to pay attention to it. So as far as why it matters, I'm gonna take you through a, basically a really simple example of a website. Um, just has one uh, HTML resource, one style sheet, uh, four scripts, two of them are blocking in the head, two of them are best practice, they're late in the body or they're async. 
Um, there's one web font. Uh, can't seem to get away from web fonts these days. And there's 13 images on the page, uh, five of them visible on the initial load. Uh, and the rest of them are sort of below the fold for tracking pixels or whatever. And so in the old days uh, with HTTP 1, um, the browser would maintain six connections per origin uh, to your website, basically. And it has an internal list of resources that it wants to fetch in the order that it wants to fetch them. And it shuffles that list around as priorities come and go um, to try and load the most important things as soon as possible. When a connection comes available, it makes the request and you have six things downloading at the same time in parallel. Um, but when something new comes up that's important to load, it picks off the, the when a connection becomes available, it picks up uh, the highest priority thing. And so it, there's a very short delay until the next high priority thing comes down. And there's a little bit of contention between resources, but it's not all that bad. With HTTP 2, um, in theory, the world got a whole lot better. Uh, the browsers move a lot of that responsibility up to the server and they can build up the entire priority tree, if you would. And they send everything to the server at once in the or as soon as they know about it and tell the server, this is the order I'd like to get things in. And so there's no delays. So like with HTTP 1.1, uh, there's a round trip delay in fetching each resource that the connection frees up and then the browser makes a request and then the server can start delivering it. When the server knows everything ahead of time in HTTP 2, one of the big wins is we get sort of the pipelining effect where everything can be downloaded one right after the other, and there's no round trip delays in between them. Assuming the server actually does what it was asked by the browser or a, a best attempt to do that, and that's part of what we're going to get into today. And so why priority, why we want to sequence things, sort of what is the optimal order of loading things in. If you think about the two scripts we have blocking in the head, if you download the two scripts at the same time, they're sharing bandwidth and they'll both complete at the same time, roughly assuming they're the same size. And then the browser is going to parse and eval the first one and then parse and eval the second one. And so you've got this blocking time where the browser is not doing anything with the CPUs while it's downloading the resources, and then they both become available, and then it's crunch, not using the network for anything, but it's using the full CPU all at the same time. If instead we sequence the scripts one after the other instead of loading them at the same time, the first script will download in half the time because it's not sharing bandwidth with the second one. While the second one's downloading, the browser can be evaling, parsing, compiling, executing the first script. And then when the second script finishes, it can do the same with that one. And that way we can overlay the, the CPU utilization for processing the script with the bandwidth on the network. And so it finishes a little bit sooner in this example. And so that's why sequencing them in the HTTP2 model works somewhat better than the old six at a time, just kind of download things in parallel of HTTP1. And why, for scripts at least, optimally we want to download them one after another in the order that the browser can best use them. When we sort of expand that to an entire page, if we want to get the user's experience, so the, the process of loading a website isn't a static thing. It's not the browser makes all of the requests, it knows everything ahead of time, the server sends everything down, and then everything's presented at once to the user. It's a, it's a journey, it's a visual experience, it's an interactive experience where the user will see some content, more content will fill in, they'll be able to interact with the page at some point, and then all of the, theoretically, hopefully, then all of the, the tracking beacons and the non-user impacting stuff will happen in the background. And so that's one of the reasons the Chrome team, for example, has been pushing on newer uh, web performance metrics. I'm not sure if you've seen the, the web vitals, uh, the largest content full paint, the first content full paint. Um, these are all metrics to try and measure sort of the early parts of the user experience rather than just the endpoint when it's complete. And the sequencing matters a lot for getting fast experiences sooner. And so in our example page, to get to the the initial content rendering as soon as possible. Optimally, what we'd want to do is send down the HTML first, followed by the, the style sheet, uh, and then followed by each script one at a time using 100% of the bandwidth. And so in this, this graph, the, the vertical, it's a pipe, if you would. So the, the vertical uh, 
part of the, the graph is how much of the bandwidth is being used by any one resource at a time. And then left to right is uh, over time. Then after the scripts have completed, in theory, the browser can actually show something to the user. It'll show the text, um, the layout, the rough outline of the page. And so that would be the first paint. Uh, if there's text, um, theoretically the first contentful paint, uh, but in this case, we've got a font. Uh, so the text, depending on if you're using font display swap or not, um, the font needs to be requested. And so at this point, the browser's done the layout and it goes, oh crap, I didn't know about this font. I need this font now to draw anything. And it makes the request for the font at a really high priority because it needs it now to display the text of the page. Optimally, we'd show that font or we download that font right after the script so that right after the font's downloaded, we can display the text for the page. And then we would download uh, the five uh, visible images concurrently. Um, I'm a big fan of progressive rendering, progressive JPEGs, uh, not, not downloading one whole image after the other. Um, usually if you've got a, a well-encoded progressive JPEG, it looks almost identical to the final state at half of the bytes. So in theory, if we're downloading the five visible images all at the same time, um, the user will see it mostly visually complete at about half of the time of downloading all of the images. And then the browser finishes downloading in the images. And at that point, the above the viewport experience is complete. The page is interactive. The user can start interacting with the content. Notice we're only at roughly half of the overall time to download the, the full page. At that point, optimally, we would run the async scripts or the end of body scripts, uh, do the background trackers, whatever. And then, uh, wouldn't necessarily call it lazy load the images, um, but that's one technique to use. But after everything is done, start loading the below the fold images so that when the user scrolls, the images will be available to them. And then finally, right at the very end, uh, we, we would have technically what used to be called the page load time, uh, which is almost an, uh, a useless metric these days, but it's everything the, the browser was doing is complete but we got the user experience to be twice as fast as that. And they saw something in a quarter of the time of it that it took to download everything. Now, the worst case scenario um, would be basically the HTML comes down, the browser discovers all the resources, it fetches them all at the same time, they all download all at the same time, they're battling for uh, contention, nothing gets displayed until almost the end when everything's been downloaded because the browser can't display anything until the CSS and both of the blocking scripts have been run. And it doesn't have those yet because it's com competing in bandwidth with all of the images, visible and invisible. And so almost right at the end, we can display everything right at once, um, but we still don't need the font. And so it needs to go request the font at that time. And now the user basically sees nothing until the entirety of the page has been downloaded. And so this is the core reason why we talk about prioritization mattering, the sequence, the ordering mattering, uh, and the order that you deliver your resources can have a huge impact on the user experience. So what does that mean for browsers? And so, like I said, the browsers make their own internal priority list uh, in the HTTP one days, they fetch them in their own order in HTTP two, they tell the server, hey, this is the order I'd like you to send me things in. So Chrome builds a linear list of resources, basically uh, a, a straight list of the order it would like things in. It's not optimal for images where we'd like to see some concurrency, but it works really well for the script case, for example. And so um, I can, down at the bottom of the page, there's a link to the actual Chrome prioritization, uh, what it ranks different elements at, but it's basically, uh style sheets are most important followed by scripts and blocking scripts in the order they were discovered as soon as fonts are discovered they get the highest priority when they're uh, discovered and so they're injected into the list dynamically uh, as they're discovered and so chrome is close to optimal at least for the early part of the render and then images will download one at a time assuming the server honors what the browser is asking for firefox um took the HTTP2 priority tree model um, completely to heart and tried something completely radical. And they use different groups with different weightings 
uh, everything largely downloads at the same time, but with different weights. So what they have, they call leaders, which are the, the HTML, the blocking scripts. Um, those will download at twice the, the bandwidth of uh, like XHR resources, async scripts, and some lower priority things. Everything still shares bandwidth. Um, and like all of the scripts download concurrently if they're all at the same priority level. Uh, but it does weight more important resources uh, more, higher. Uh, and then beyond the leaders, they have followers, which are, it doesn't download images at the same time as the blocking scripts, for example. It'll wait for the blocking scripts to finish. And then it moves into the followers group, where it'll download all of the images all at the same time. Um, so it's it's good for the image case, not so good for the the blocking uh, scripts case, it's somewhat better than the worst case scenario where everything is downloaded because it does uh, sequence higher priority things first and give more weight to more important things. It just downloads them all concurrently. Um, Safari largely uses the model um, that was in place with Chrome before Chrome forked, uh, which is a speedy model where it, uh, speedy is the, the protocol before HTTP2, where it waits all of the resources by their priority everything downloads at the same time all at the same time but higher priority resources get more of the bandwidth so for example uh, blocking scripts get three times the priority or three times the bandwidth of the images and so you'll be downloading the scripts and css at the same time as images it's just they'll get a lot more bandwidth in theory um it works reasonably well it's still better than the worst case scenario uh it's not as bad as it could be. Uh, edge, classic Edge. New Edge, uh, Chromium-based, behaves exactly like Chrome, Chrome. awesome. Um, classic Edge is worst case scenario, didn't support prioritization at all. It basically sent all of the requests and they all had the same priority and everything shared bandwidth all at the same time. So what we've talked about so far is a nice optimal page, um, one domain it's served from our origin only, there's no third parties. Um, this is largely the model that HTTP2 was built for. Um, if you look at the companies that did the initial testing of Speedy and the evolution to HTTP2, you've got Google, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, where they have sort of all of the control over their content. They're all coming from one origin. And so prioritization worked really well because um, HTTP2, HTTP not HTTP poo, um, can prioritize all of the resources on that one connection. But once you start connecting multiple connections, you can't prioritize against each other. The server has no idea what's going on against the other resources. And so it becomes the Wild West, the Thunderdome, if you would, uh, when you when you have resources coming in from multiple origins, from multiple, multiple third parties. Um, and they basically, it, it comes down to the network sorts it out, right? They all throw everything they can and the network figures it out uh, what order things are gonna be delivered in. And so that happens a lot more often than you might think. Uh, third parties, obviously, there's tons and tons of them these days. Um, SDKs, uh, social widgets, uh, ad networks, retargeting, um, A-B testing platforms. It's uh, not unusual to see 20 plus uh, different third parties on any given site. Um, but you can also do it to yourself. Uh, if you do domain sharding from the old HTTP one days when the browsers used to do six connections per domain, um, it was a common practice to create new domains. And so you could get 12 connections or, or more connections uh, and download much more content in parallel. And so if you do that, you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot because now your servers can't prioritize across those. There is support in HTTP2 for connection coalescing. Uh, if all of those uh, static domains end up resolving to the same set of servers, then it might not be as bad, but it's something you have to watch out for. And just keep in mind that you can really only effectively prioritize over a single connection. And what it looks like, so this is a web page test waterfall. And when you have everything coming down all at the same time, the dark chunks in the waterfall are when it's actually downloading content on that connection. And you can see like the, the fonts, which is the, the red uh, second line in the waterfall, 
they get stretched out instead of downloading as soon as possible because they're competing with scripts from like eight different servers all at the same time, which completely de defeats the purpose of us wanting to get fonts as soon as the browser needs them. And so we built a test, Andy Davies and I, uh, is http2fastyet.com, uh, where it's a test to see, given a server, um, does that server actually support HTTP2 prioritization correctly? Uh, if you request high, high priority resources, will it interrupt the delivery of low priority resources to send those? Because that's critical to getting HTTP2 priority working. Uh, without it, um, you kind of end up at the Wild West and you end up, even if the browser supports prioritization, you end up in a worst case scenario. And so what it does is it warms up the connection, it requests a whole bunch of low priority images, and then it delays until the network starts flowing, and it requests two high priority uh, images. Uh, and the, the goal is to see those last two images, do they download relatively quickly uh, and interrupt the download of all of the other resources? And this waterfall is an example of where it does work as you'd expect it. It interrupts the in-flight requests, um, ultimately, you'd see it take just one round trip, but realistically, it takes a little longer uh, to interrupt uh, data flows. In practice, what we see in the wild, um, most often what you see is it gets queued behind the low priority requests. And this is because of server buffers. If you have overly large buffers on the server, the server thinks it's behaving correctly and prioritizing correctly and sends everything out in the order that it can, but it gets queued up in the buffers and the high priority requests get sent as soon as possible, but it gets jammed up behind all of the low priority resources. Um, some servers don't support prioritization at all and they round robin across all of the requests, um, basically delaying everything. Um, and there's, you know, there's all sorts of mixes of all of these behaviors. Uh, we've seen Honestly, it's hard to imagine what the servers are actually doing. Um, but in almost all cases, the two high priority resources end up uh, downloading slower than they would if priority was working. And so uh, one of the things we track on is HTTP2 fast yet is the state of all of the CDNs. Basically, these are companies who are, their whole purpose is to serve HTTP content. Um, and how well do they actually do it in the case of HTTP2? And there's really, uh, I mean, it's sad to say, fundamentally really only three or four CDNs that do it correctly out of everything that's out there. Uh, Akamai, Cloudflare, Fastly, luckily they're the bigger ones in the CDN list. If you're one of those, you're in pretty good shape. Um, but there are a lot of really popular ones that aren't working well. And the more scary part to me is all of the cloud, cloud load balancers. Uh, if you're on AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, their load balancers also have it completely broken. Uh, when you're doing dev testing, um, dev tools throttling will lie to you. Um, it doesn't actually do packet level traffic shaping. And so one of the things you need to watch out for is uh, using network link conditioner, for example, on a Mac is a really good way to, to emulate it and to test for prioritization. If you're using DevTools 3G connection, for example, the results you get are going to lie to you. And on the left is the, the DevTools waterfall compared to the web page test waterfall for the same load. And you can see the two images at the end look like they're loading at the end, but in reality, if you're actually traffic shaping correctly, they are prioritizing correctly. What does HTTP 3 bring to the mix? Um, so it completely abandoned the HTTP 2 prioritization model. It was a mess, it was hard to implement, um, hard for anyone to actually rationalize and understand. Unfortunately, the spec launched without any explicit prioritization support. It's an extension. Uh, hopefully everyone implements the extension, uh, but it's something we're definitely gonna have to watch out for. It's all header based, um, so it moves out of the protocol level and the browser adds a header that says, this is the priority of the re request I'm making. Um, and a uh, really cool feature is you can actually override it as well from the server and the server can say, no, I know the, the client asked for it at this priority, but it's actually a higher priority resource. And so there, the way it works is there's eight priority levels. Um, 
basically mirroring what the browsers do internally. And there's a, an interlace flag, if you would, the progressive flag. Uh, do you download these resources at the same time as others or one after the other uh, to let you split uh, images, for example, from uh, scripts? And so it looks like this. You have a priority header. You give it an urgency and progressive, and the, the server can override it. So thank you. Uh, we're going to go over some Q&A now. Um, if we can't get to your questions live, I'll also be in the video chat and happy to answer them there. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. That was a very, very good and insightful uh, uh, analysis and the presentation. Um, so once we are waiting for a few questions, uh, and you and me, we had a little bit of a chat before this session. Uh, there's one thing top of my mind I want to ask. Since you mentioned that HTTP2 uh, is new and supposedly better, why do you think it requires so much effort to get it to work right, I mean, part of it what you touched upon in this presentation, but if you if you can summarize this, sure. I mean, it's it's technically superior um, the way it lets you pass all of responsibility to the server, and if you have done the engineering on the server side, it is much better and much more effective. Um, I honestly don't know. There's so much of the serving stack that can introduce buffering that in the case of HTTP 1, a lot of servers were tuned for just turn uh, data over to the client as quickly as possible. And so when it came to HTTP 2, they, they tried to stick with that model and a lot of uh, tuning that uh, ops teams have done is basically large outbound buffers, uh, reduce the CPU overhead, uh, reduce the spin cycles and move as many bits as possible. And that's the opposite of what you want to do for HTTP2. And I think it might have just been our failure in messaging when we launched HTTP2 that we didn't make clear um, that it's an entire stack that needs to be optimized. And it's not just turn the feature on on your server and you're set to go. Uh, there's a lot of um, buffer tuning, uh, congestion control tuning that needs to be done to actually get it to work correctly. Perfect. Thank you, thank you, uh, Patrick, for that. Uh, we have actually a question over YouTube, so that's very exciting. We make it a bit more interactive. We have a question from Kindar actually asking, uh, asking obviously you directly, Patrick. Can you tell a browser to reorder priorities based on your website settings, like preload many things? Uh, why not preload everything? Yeah, so uh, you do have some control. A lot of it's going to depend on the browser. Um, but there's uh, what we call priority hints are probably the easiest thing to search for to get a full context of all of them. There's It includes connection level um, hints like pre-connect and DNS prefetch and prefetch. Uh, but it also in includes request uh, level um, prioritization where you can, uh, if you do link rel preload, uh, you can tell the browser about a script, for example, before it discovers it, or you can tell it about a font that you know it's going to need before it discovers it. Um, and those are best used for when the browser needs something that's high priority, but it's not explicitly laid out in the HTML. The browser's generally really good at tearing through the HTML, seeing what's in it, and figuring out what the best order to load everything that's statically defined in the HTML is. Um, but if you have CSS background images, for example, um, those won't be discovered until layout is done. And so you may want to, to hint uh, to preload the background image or fonts are a big one uh, since they're also not discovered until layout. But also if you're doing like an A-B testing or if you're using Google Tag Manager to inject scripts, the browser doesn't see those until it runs the Tag Manager. And so you may want to hint, hey, go ahead and preload these scripts. I know you're going to need them. The trick is to do it in the right order uh, so you don't shoot yourself in the foot. If you want to preload um, scripts that are going to be injected by the tag manager, you're better off putting the, the link rel preload tag after the tag manager script so that it loads in the correct order. Otherwise, you may end up getting into the worst case scenario where we had, if you try and preload everything, 
um, you can be delaying your critical resources, your critical scripts, uh, your style sheets to the point where you're actually pushing your start render out uh, unintentionally. And so it's, it's a careful balance. Um, and you have to be really careful with the preload. If you do it in a header, um, some CDNs will actually HTTP2 push uh, those resources in the headers and can in even interrupt the delivery of the HTML itself and make them really high priority. So you test, experiment, um, preload is probably the most important of the, the hints that you can do to boost the priority of things. There's also lazy load um, and it's currently on hold, but there was the priority hints for where you can do an importance tag on a script, for example, and you can say this is an important script or this is a low important script uh, or for images and things like that. Hopefully that'll come back uh, where you can hint a little bit to the browser. Perfect. Uh, thank you for, for, for this answer, Patrick. Uh, one more question. I see our good uh, organizers are wondering if I'm going to ask the question. It's from Gianluca Braccini. And and he goes uh, with a question, are some domains or multiple domains still relevant today considering using CDN? Um, if you can avoid it, I'd steer away from doing sharding domains or subdomains. Um, you generally, in an HTTP2 world, which is the world we live in today, um, you want to serve your HTML through your CDN, uh, even though it's dynamic, and serve all of your static resources from the same origin. Uh, and preferably your fonts from the same origin so it doesn't have to spin up a new connection as well. Because that way the browser can actually prioritize everything uh, or the server can prioritize everything. It, it doesn't have to do any more DNS lookups. It doesn't have to set up new connections. Even with, with connection coalescing in HTTP2 where you can sort of make up for some of that domain sharding, it still has to do DNS lookups for all of the domains to discover that they can be coalesced onto the same connections. And so your best model these days is serve everything from the same origin as the page uh, and minimize the domains as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, one more question from my side, since I'm, uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, and then also uh, there's uh, kind of like quite a few uh, excellent speakers after us. Uh, is there a, you talked about this uh, quite in depth, but is there a good strategy for prioritization for prioritizing that works across all browsers? Would you would you would you comment on that? Um, so I think as long as you if you have relatively clean HTML where you've sequenced things in the order that you want them, you will get as good of prioritization as you can get from the browsers that support it. Classic Edge, all bets are off because it doesn't prioritize anything. Um, but generally, if you have scripts in the order that they're needed, uh, if you have images, one of the things with images, for example, to watch out for is if you have a carousel where you have one visible image and then it rotates through and the other four images aren't visible yet, and then you've got some other images, if those other four images are right after the first image in the HTML, um, they're probably going to get a higher priority than most of the other images that are invisible. So as much as you can, if you can hide things from the browser that aren't going to be visible right away, or you can sequence them in the HTML in the order you want them downloaded, most of the browsers will do a reasonably good job of uh, fetching things in the order that you wanted them. And then some of them, um, Chromium-based ones in particular, Firefox gives some support for it let you hint and adjust those priorities with preload and some of the other uh, markup adjustments. Perfect. Uh, Patrick, I think we are uh, out of time, unfortunately. Uh, I've seen uh, uh, Ken and Gianluca Boss questions are super happy and they thank you for the great insight. So do the organizers at Shift. We're done for today. Thank you so much for being, uh, for being the guest and such a great presenter. Obviously, all of you can check Patrick's socials uh, on the website and here on the YouTube, uh, on the chat on YouTube, uh, and then feel free to reach out directly. Obviously, I'm sure Patrick has a lot of knowledge to share. Uh, we can do this for hours. Thank you so much, Patrick. This is really, really awesome. Really, really Thank, you. Thank you. Like I said, I'll be in the, the video chat as well, answering any other questions that come up. Thank you, Patrick.
Thank you for that, Patrick. And now moving on with our conference, our next speaker is a developer advocate for the web browser Samsung Internet. She's passionate about progressive web apps and web performance and is also the co-chair of the W3C Immersive Web Groups, which is bringing VR and AR to the web via the WebXR device API. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us in person today, so she has pre-recorded this for us, but I'm sure it will be brilliant. Let's welcome Ada Rose Cannon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ada Rose Cannon. I'm here to talk with you today about WebXR, both what it can do today and what we have planned for the future. Before I begin, a little bit about me and who I work for. So I'm a developer advocate for the web browser Samsung Internet. Samsung Internet is a really good, highly customizable Android web browser. We have a focus on privacy and security. We have built-in tracking blocking and extensions for ad blocking. As a developer advocate, I try to help developers with the latest features in the web platform to build websites which make the most of everything the web browser can offer. So if you have any questions about Samsung Internet or WebXR, please reach out to me or one of my Samsung Internet colleagues through email or social media. As part of my developer advocacy work, I also will do some work in web standards. I am co-chair of the W3C Immersive Web Working Group and the Immersive Web Community Group. These two groups work together to develop the web standards for working with immersive hardware, such as virtual reality headsets and other immersive devices. The core part of this standardization effort is the WebXR Device API, also known as WebXR for short. WebXR at its core is an API designed to access the sensors and displays of immersive hardware, such as virtual reality headsets and augmented reality headsets, but a wider range of devices too. WebXR works by knowing what the user is looking at from the device's sensors, we can render a scene using WebGL or any other rendering library in the web. And we can render it from the user's point of view. We can then send it to be displayed on the headset. And this loop of knowing what the user's looking at and rendering from their point of view is what gives the feeling of being inside in a virtual scene. The difficult part here is supporting the wide range of immersive devices. Building a web standard that's going to work not only for the devices which are available nowadays, of which is quite a wide range, but also being general enough to support future devices too. The first type of virtual reality headsets supported in the web were immersive VR headsets, like the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. These earlier headsets were extremely powerful and gave a great experience. They worked by taking the headset with its sensors and displays and connecting it to a computer, usually by a very, 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 very long cable. Later headsets would do the information transfer between the computer and the headset wirelessly. But using a wired connection is still a popular solution today. These headsets, whilst they gave a really good experience, they had one major drawback. They had to be connected to an extremely high-powered gaming PC. And these computers are very expensive. And often people couldn't use the, the computer they already had in their home. But there was another popular type of headset that rose up alongside these. And these were headsets in which you put your phone in the headset itself. So headsets like the Gear VR or the Google Daydream 
let the user take their smartphone and put it inside the headset. When they did that, it would use the sensors in the phone and sometimes additional sensors in the headset as well to display the virtual reality experience on the phone screen. Because a lot of the heavy lifting was done by the phone, which was in the headset, it was a lot cheaper than connecting to a very expensive external device. But because it was only a smartphone, it was limited with the fidelity of the virtual reality experiences it could do. But they were extremely accessible to people and they were very popular devices. At the time, the majority of headsets were these lower end of headsets than the high powered tethered ones. Nowadays, virtual reality headsets, like some of the more popular ones, tend to take this format. This is the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest, like the high end headsets um, I talked about at the beginning, could do really good tracking. It's got cameras on the outside, which let it scan the environment and work out your position in 3D space. It also has extra controllers that also do really good positional and rotation tracking. But like the mobile phone-based headset, it also runs off a mobile chipset. So it's not quite as powerful as the, as the VR you can get by running off a computer. But these headsets have proven to be very popular and really hit the sweet spot in what consumers want. Shortly after the introduction of the new virtual reality headsets, there also started to be augmented reality headsets as well. These are also known as mixed reality. You'll see the terms used either or. These headsets, like the Microsoft HoloLens or the Magic Leap, these headsets were very expensive but would do self-contained um, augmented reality, where the virtual content would be overlaid onto the user's environment. These are incredibly powerful devices. And if you ever get a chance to try one out, I really recommend it. It's an incredible experience. I haven't got one here to show you because there's a lot more than I can afford, but hopefully we'll start to see this kind of headset be more popular in the future. But immersive technology isn't just about strapping a computer to your face anymore. In the early days of web VR, a popular way to get users engaged before they could use a VR headset was to show them what it looked like on the phone. So they would use their phone as a window into the virtual world, where it would use the phone's sensors, like the accelerometer, to work out what they were looking at. This was a really powerful way of doing virtual reality and something which we wanted to make sure was incorporated into WebXR. Another handset based XR experience was a huge success and an app I'm sure many of you listening have played before. This was Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go used the camera on the phone to show you the world whilst be able to place Pokemon into that environment. And it really showed how handheld augmented reality can work really well and be extremely popular when you've combined it with an engaging user experience. And both of these demonstrations really showed to us that virtual reality isn't just head mounted anymore. A couple of times in this talk, I've mentioned an old API called WebVR. This was the virtual reality API, which targeted just virtual reality headsets. But because of the wide range of devices we need to support now, we found that WebVR just wasn't going to be future proof. A new API needed to be developed with the idea of working on future devices as the forethought. It also needed to handle not just virtual reality, but also augmented reality and handset-based experiences. So on this table, WebVR would just support the top left quadrant of traditional virtual reality. WebXR has to support augmented reality and handset devices, but also devices that do immersive sessions in other ways. It also has to support technology which hasn't been invented yet. 
where VR was deprecated near the end of last year. But we only deprecated it once WebXR was developed enough and available enough to be able to replace its features fully. So if you have built a website before with WebVR, please update the libraries you're using to use WebXR instead. That way, your, whatever you build will continue to work into the future. This is what virtual reality on the web looks like today. In this example, I've navigated to a web page in a web browser where it's showing me the scene rendered in WebGL. I push the Enter VR button, and I am placed inside the immersive scene where I can use the virtual reality controllers I have in my hand to interact with the world. This particular video was recorded in Firefox Reality on the Oculus Quest. But because it uses WebXR, it will work in any virtual reality headset, as long as the browser supports WebXR, whether that's on a mobile device or on a high-end desktop computer. As long as it supports WebXR, it should work. This is the URL so you can try it out, or you can scan the QR code. If you have a VR headset handy, I recommend trying it out in that too. If you have a phone, you can view it in line, straight in the browser, or try it out in a cardboard headset if you have one of those. If you don't own any, any headset, a cardboard headset is a great low-cost way to get into um, testing virtual reality. It doesn't have any controllers, but at least you can look around. This demonstration shows off just the core of WebXR. But my goal here today is to show off some of the features that have just landed in browsers, which you can try out today, and some of the features which are a bit further down the road, which will hopefully be coming over the next couple of years. The first feature I'd like to demonstrate is probably one of the most important ones. If you remember rightly, thinking back to that video, where I was using the Oculus Quest headset, the controllers look like this. But that wasn't what I was holding in my hand in the demo. In, my, in the demo, I was holding those gray sticks. But what I want to see is the real hardware I'm holding in my hand in the virtual scene. The WebXR device API has two things which work together to accomplish that goal. The first is the WebXR Gamepad API. The WebXR Gamepad API is very similar to the existing Gamepad API in the browser. The goal of it is to tell you what buttons are being pressed on the device. It's exactly the same representation you would get from the regular Gamepad API, but um, it's only available from the WebXR device API itself. So you don't have to worry about regular controllers getting mixed in with virtual reality controllers between the Gamepad API. They share the same design, but they're, they're separate. The second feature we have to enable us to show virtual reality controllers in the headset itself is a library which we maintain. This library is a pretty complex project, which has three main parts. It has 3D models of as many virtual reality controller hardware as we can get. These models are usually provided by the manufacturer, and they're already ready to use on the web, and they're fully rigged up for animation. We also have JSON files, which describe how the various controller buttons from the GamePad API map to the buttons on the 3D model which are ready to be animated. And finally, we have a library which does that connection. Hardware vendors can update this library as new hardware is released. They can add new JSON files and controllers. So as long as you're using the live version of the library, your experiences will continue to work long into the future and will always show the hardware the user is holding in their hand on the device itself. And here's the end result.
In this VR scene, I'm holding the real controllers I have in my hand. I can see the model and buttons move as I move them. I can see the buttons get pressed as I push them. This functionality is actually built into some libraries already, and they make it very simple to use. 3JS has great examples of how to get this set up. Once we'd built this, we'd considered WebXR virtual reality complete. So once this feature was added, that was when we started deprecating WebVR. But so far, I've just talked about virtual reality. There's the other half of the XR story, augmented reality. Augmented reality is brought to WebXR via the augmented reality module. The augmented reality module primarily handles making the screen transparent, so you can see the world through the device. On some devices like smartphones or some headsets which use externally facing cameras, this means showing the camera behind the augmented reality experience and telling the augmented reality experience the best way to deliver their content. Some headsets have a transparent screen on which the augmented reality experience is projected, in which case it just tells them that this is a transparent screen and that you should handle it accordingly. But being able to see the world over below virtual content is just one part of augmented reality. It doesn't let you interact with the real world. And that's where the next feature comes in. Hit testing. In this video, I am placing a dinosaur in my living room. This lets me work out the real life position of whatever point on the screen the developer chooses. For this example, we're working out the real life point of whatever's in the middle of the screen, which in this case is going to be position on my floor. Each frame, we get this position and we place the dinosaur there. So as I move my phone around, it moves the dinosaur to the new position. Once I'm done and I tap on the screen, we then stop doing the scanning and I can move my phone around and the dinosaur stays in place. The ability to interact with the real world combined with the ability to see the real world are the cornerstones of augmented reality. And you can use these today in, Sam in the latest Samsung Internet Beta. You can also use it in Chrome and in other browsers too. And now we have the main abilities for virtual reality and augmented reality. These are like the minimum viable products for both. And I'm going to show you how you can start building with these. The first thing I need to reiterate about WebXR is that it's a WebGL based API. This means you can't use HTML and CSS to display objects in the scene. You can't have labels made with HTML and CSS and put them in 3D. It's pure WebGL. Unfortunately, WebGL is extremely verbose and extremely low level. This is the code for rendering just a single cube. It's hundreds of lines long. So it's probably best to work with the library. And thankfully, there's quite a few. A very popular one is 3JS which has been actively maintained for a very long time and is always getting new features. And there's A-Frame, which is based around um, describing scenes using HTML. I'll go into that a bit later. Then there's Babylon.js, which like 3JS is a JavaScript based engine, but it's made by Microsoft and it's, really, it's a really good product. React 360, as you can imagine, is maintained by Facebook. And it does, it's kind of like A-Frame in that it's an abstraction um, over a JavaScript library, except for this case it's into React. And we also have Play Canvas, which is another great JavaScript-based um, WebGL solution. So let's talk about A-Frame. This is probably one of my favorites, which is why I want to talk about it. A-Frame allows you to create a 3D scene declaratively using HTML. How it works 
is by being a web component wrapper around 3JS. So it's got a set of custom HTML elements, and these, and these control 3JS underneath. And the nice thing about it, and one of the reasons I like talking about it, is that I can fit the entire thing on one slide. So here I have a HTML file. At the top, I import the A-frame library. And below that, I've added a box, a sphere, and a cylinder. These get rendered by A-frame and shown in the web page. But since these are just normal web components, you can control them with the same JavaScript you would use to control any normal HTML element. So if you're a web developer and you want to get started in WebXR, it's a great place to start because you're still working with the same HTML you're probably used to. But if you are a more advanced developer, it's even who has experience with 3JS, then it's fantastic still because you can start building your own A-frame components using 3JS and then you can share them on the web. A-frame like 3JS also has a great community and some really good examples out there and is a great place to get started building virtual reality. And the icing on the cake is that it uses WebXR already and is augmented reality and virtual reality ready out the box. And all on augmented reality available devices, it will let you use augmented reality without having to do much additional work. Now I've talked about the features which we have in WebXR today and how you can start playing with it today. But let's talk about what's coming in the future. Some of these are just around the corner and some of these are a bit further down the line. But hopefully we'll start seeing them in browsers um, not too far away. The first thing I'd like to bring up is probably one of the more important ones. If you remember earlier, I said WebXR was a WebGL only API. And right now it is. Now this isn't great because it makes it very hard to build an accessible experience. If you want to show a label in WebGL, you have to write it on an image and you have to render that image onto a cube. But the DOM overlay API will let you pick a single HTML element to take with you into WebXR. The user agent will place it into the scene and you can interact with it just as you would with JavaScript and you can build it and style it with HTML and CSS exactly as you would expect. It's very similar to the full screen API and how it behaves. The nice thing about this is that because it's HTML and CSS, it can be described to the user if they're using a screen reader, making it a lot more accessible. And there is another advantage, because if you're rendering labels in 3JS by writing text into a bitmap and show, putting it onto a 3D object, there is a big time difference well, not big in the grand scheme of things, but in terms of virtual reality where the latencies are very small, there's a pretty big gap between rendering it to the scene and when it actually gets shown to the user and the light from the screen hits their eyes. For stuff like text, you want to make this latency as small as possible. So because the user agent is handling it, it can put it into the scene at the very last moment, giving it the exact correct position. This makes it a lot easier for the user to read. And finally, because it's HTML and CSS, these two languages are fantastic at working together to build powerful 2D layouts. And that's something that's very difficult to do in WebGL. So you can take advantage of all the CSS and HTML features you need. So this is a feature I'm very much looking forward to. I think it's gonna be really good for people building interfaces for like storefronts, for museums, any place where you want to give additional information or let the user interact with a 2D environment whilst also using augmented reality. Next is lighting estimation. 
Lighting estimation enables virtual objects to approximate the lighting from the surrounding scene. It does this by using computer vision to work out roughly where the light is coming from, what color it is, what its angle is. And so you can reproduce that in your 3D scene, giving your item very similar lighting to the surrounding environment which makes it feel a lot more natural, a lot more in part of the environment. This is really fantastic for building an engaging augmented reality experience. It, it encourages the user to forget that the things they're seeing aren't real and gives it a lot more weight in the scene. There's another feature which gives a subtle improvement to augmented reality. And this feature is anchors. It's really hard to illustrate how anchors work, since it's a very subtle but powerful effect. As augmented reality scenes run, the underlying platform continuously scans the environment, and it gets a better idea of the coordinate system, how far away objects are from one another, and stuff might need to be updated. But if you've placed an object far away from the origin, and the scene gets slightly scaled up or down, these objects are going to drift slightly from where you left them. And this isn't something objects do in real life. In real life, you put an object down and you expect it to stay there. The way anchors work is that when the scene updates, the anchor will be moved accordingly to, so that it appears to remain in place. So any objects you, re you place relative to the anchor will also remain in place. This is a feature which is used a lot in HoloLens and the Magic Leap in the, in the high-end augmented reality experiences to give a really high fidelity experience where you look at a scene and be like, yeah, of course that's a real object because it's not moving anywhere, it's behaving really naturally. The next feature I'd like to talk about is layers. If you remember a few minutes ago, I talked about the DOM overlay API and how one of its benefits is that because it's rendered by the user agent, it can be rendered a lot closer to the time the pixels themselves light up on the screen, giving a much better and crisper experience to the user. Well, layers is a generic version of that letting you display images and videos on simple shapes in the scene, which are then handled by the user agent. This provides two significant benefits. If you're rendering a video, normally in WebGL, you have to take each video frame and copy it across to the graphics card, put it to a texture where it gets rendered again and sent up to the scene. Or if because the user agent is handling it, it can just take that video frame and show it straight in the browser. So if you're doing something like 360 videos or you're building a virtual reality cinema, this is going to give a very, very efficient and clear experience. And if you want to show something like text, if you can't use the DOM overlay API, this is also going to give a really not too bad experience as a fallback. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about, hands. Some augmented reality and virtual reality systems have the capability of tracking your hands instead of using controllers. This gives a really naturalistic feel when you reach out and just grab an object in, th in the virtual space. You can just pull, pull it out the air, or you can use gestures to summon objects into reality. It makes you feel like a doing magic, that you're just summoning stuff. And it's just a very fun feature that I really hope lands soon. There are a lot more features than these that will hopefully come to WebXR. These are just a few of my favorites that are being worked on at the moment. But if you want to find out more, please check out these resources. We have immersiveweb.dev, which is a website maintained by the immersive web groups. 
with a table showing you how different features are supported in different platforms. It also has guides which show you how to work with different libraries to build an XR experience. It also has links to some articles and useful tools and is a good place to get started. If you want to find out more about what's going on in the immersive web working groups, check out our GitHub. All of the work we do is done in the open. You can look at issues and pull requests. You can look at the proposals repo and see what features are being requested. And finally, if you want to find out what we've got planned for the next two years, check out our charter in which we list all the things which we'd like to start working on. And finally, if you want to get involved, well, if, you're, if you work for a company which is a member organization of the W3C, you can ask your AC rep about participating in the Immersive Web Working Group. But if not, you can still participate in the Immersive Web Community Group without needing any kind of um, W3C representation. That, the community group is open to everyone and is where a lot of the cutting edge work gets done. Thank you so much for listening. I've been Ada Rose Cannon, and I really hope you have fun making immersive websites. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, Ada. And with that, that brings us to the end of our first half of this conference. Um, now, something for you to do over the break. It is with great pleasure that I can announce we have a date for our in-person conference, which will be taking place on the 14th and 15th of September in Split. So that's a date for your diaries. You can check out all the information online. It will be there shortly. But it's now time for a break. Grab yourself a coffee, get yourself outside, and we'll be back with you in about five minutes time. I love coming to Shift every year. First of all, Croatia is beautiful. What's really nice about Shift as a development conference is that it really brings people from all walks of development, um, and you don't really see that anymore. The vibe here is incredible. There's such a buzz everywhere. Uh, I think 1,200 people turned up. I'm looking forward to the rest of today. There's a whole other day of conference tomorrow. I'm often baffled by not how much I learn, but how I learn that I don't know yet. So I always go home from this sort of inspired, but also just very keen to just keep on reading up on stuff and learning what I evidently did not know.
welcome back. Now, I hope you had a good break. If you can hear my voice, that means that break is now over and it's time to get back in front of the screen and carry on with our conference. Our next speaker is an electrical engineer with a master's degree and a specialization in automation. They're always interested in new and exciting projects and technologies, especially in renewable energy and energy efficiency. Let's welcome from InfoBip, Dubravko Bogovic. Hello everyone and welcome to my talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about GraphQL. We're going to see the combination between GraphQL and React. We're going to do a quick start. We're going to do a small demo where you can see how this actually works. So let's dive right into it. So hello again. My name is Dubravko Bogovic. I'm working at InfoBip. Uh, we are using this combination of technology there, so you will hear a bit about my experiences with this. But first, let's get into why we are doing this. So, the good old REST API. Well, let's do a quick refresher. Uh, we need a lot of endpoints to get all the functionalities we need with a REST API. So if we need one item, we need to get have a GET request with some ID. And if we need additional data for that, well, we need another endpoint with some other uh, information. Say we have a related table and we want to get data from that table, we should have another GET request that will get us this data. Well. This seems very complicated and uh, a lot of work on the back end. So let's see if we can do this a bit better and faster. First, forget everything you learned about APIs. And let's get into GraphQL. Well, what's GraphQL? It's a query language for your API. What does that mean? Well, we don't have to have a million endpoints to get all the functionalities we need. In this case, we can have only one. But we have to have a query language that we will use to communicate with that API. So how does that look like? Well, first we have to describe our data so that the API knows how to interpret our data in our database or whatever we have on, on our backend. And we do that through schemas, which looks something like this. So let's say we have a project with some properties. Okay, how are we gonna get that data? Well, we write a GraphQL query that looks something like this. Okay, we want to get the project where the name is something like GraphQL, and we wanna get its tagline. And we would get our data back as a JSON response with the data we need. What's different, what is different here than the rest? Well, we can add fields uh, in the query here uh, whenever we want. So our front end maybe wants to show another property or do some check. Well, we can just add our properties here and they will get the data. We don't have to change our backend or anything. And we don't have to get the scope of data that we had defined on our API. We can just get the fields that we want and we don't have a forest of properties on our front end and we have to filter through them, see what we need, what we don't need. It's simpler and faster. Also, if we need some details about uh, data property. We can also add that here. We will see that later. And as we can see, you can filter the data and you can modify the data. We'll see how later. So GraphQL, what are the features? Well, as I said, we can get what we need 
uh, we have a schema that provides us strong types. So we can use TypeScript on our front end and get IntelliSense for everything and uh, get checks while we write our code. Also, we can share our code, reuse it. We can speed up our application development because, well, we need only one API, only one endpoint, and our front end is practically free to do whatever it wants with that endpoint. Okay, what else can we do? What about permissions? Well, we can also do that. Uh, on the back end, we can do some checks. We'll see uh, how to do that later in uh, open source uh, GraphQL server. Also, we can do data subscriptions. So if you need some data to be served to the front end as soon as it changes, we have a way to do that with GraphQL. Of course, you have to implement that on your API, on your GraphQL API. But if you use, again, an open source uh, project that already has that, well, you can have your application up and running in a couple of minutes, per se. OK, but of course, we have some drawbacks. Well, what are those? Well, since we're communicating only with a JSON objects, we can't upload a file, so we still have to create custom endpoints for uploading files. OK, fine. It returns only JSON, so we can't download a file through this. Uh, also, caching. Mostly, you have to implement your own uh, way of caching. So there are some ways to cache data on the front end. And if you're building your own GraphQL API, you can do that on the back end also by yourself. Uh, as these queries are can be complex and uh, they can get a lot of different, uh, say, tables from your database in one query, they can become very complex and they can that can slow down your execution. Oh, and also, since as we have seen, the GraphQL API has its own language, so you have to learn that, and that slows down the learning curve. But this is very popular and getting popular by the day, so who uses this? Well, here's a small list with some links to uh, the companies that use this. So there are big names here. GitHub, Shopify, Docker, Twitter, IBM. And these are some examples of how they use this. So for example, Netflix, we probably all use Netflix. Well, they decided to put a GraphQL, a GraphQL API between their REST uh, services and their clients. So only the backend needs to be changed to get some new data and front end can just choose what it needs when it needs. And IBM also has a GraphQL gateway in which they uh, combine REST uh, APIs and uh, GraphQL ones. And also you can uh, mix and match your front end to use REST or GraphQL. So let's take and make a quick overview of the operations that are possible in GraphQL. Well, first of all, queries. A query means we are getting some data from our server. OK, how do we write a GraphQL query? Well, first we have the keyword query. After that, uh, we use the name of the data we are getting from our uh, GraphQL schema, which is our data definition for the GraphQL. And then we can uh, write some uh, conditions. Uh, so let's say we want a user that has ID of one and an alignment that we want to pass into the GraphQL query. 
So we define a variable, in this case alignment, that uh, we can pass in as a string. All variables have to have their own type, so GraphQL knows what to expect. And they can have a default, of course. And after that, we define uh, the data that we want to get. Here we see uh, data from this uh, data type and uh, a related data type with some of its properties. Also, here we see that we can uh, rename one of the properties to an alias. Say, we know that a full name is always a full name, and let's just rename it to name. And this whole thing is our GraphQL query. Uh, these colors can help you see what is what here. Uh, OK, so this is how we get the data. And when we get the data, we want to change something. OK, maybe we want to create a review for a Star Wars episode. OK, how are we going to do that? Well, let's see. Again, we have our schema that has some uh, data type, OK? And we want to change the data. That's kind of like mutating the data, OK? So we have a mutation keyword. After that, we can pass in, of course, some uh, variables and define the data that we want to insert in this case. Uh, with mutations, uh, you can insert, you can change the data, you can delete the data. That uh, the uh, right interface for that is defined by the GraphQL server. Uh, after uh, in the demo, we will see how this this works for uh, uh, open source GraphQL API. So we give our variables to this query, and we get a result of what is inserted into our database. So again, this is all JSON. We send this mutation to the server with these variables and get a result of the data that we inserted. OK, uh, I mentioned some GraphQL servers and the differences. Well, depending on the server, we have some GraphQL flavors, and they can have some extra features like fragments. Fragments are reusable parts of code that can be, uh, say, input instead of this, these two columns. If we use this a lot of times through our code, we can just create a fragment and use that fragment in all the places that we need these properties. Another thing are directives. Directives change our query according to some variable. For example, an includes directive will include these fields if this variable is true. There are a lot of possible directives, and you can implement your own if you're making your own GraphQL server. And subscriptions are ways to get real time data from our server. They are well, in a sense, simple, as they uh, usually replace a query. We replace the query uh, keyword with the subscription keyword. And uh, the uh, front end subscribes to the data on our GraphQL server and gets all the changes uh, as soon as they happen. So let's see what we're going to use in our demo. There is a Hasura project that is open source, and it's a GraphQL server that connects to a Postgres database. So we spin it up, connect it to our Postgres database, and we have a GraphQL server which we can query. We have listed some features here. OK, they have subscriptions. Cool, that's what we need. Uh, we have dynamic access to uh, our data, so we can create a custom authorization scheme for that and call um, an endpoint to authorize the access to our data. We can define access to the data 
per column or per row inside the Hasura server. Uh, we can limit the queries that we can execute by an allowed list. We can merge query. We can merge GraphQL schemas from multiple places into one graph uh, into one Hasura server. And we can trigger webhooks on database events from the Hasura server. Also, we can uh, see how this server will query the data in our database by using uh, performance analysis, which will actually give us the SQL that this uh, server will generate in somewhere inside of it. Uh, we're going to look at it just as a black box that, that connects to our database. Uh, here I have to note that every uh, GraphQL server can have its own flavor of GraphQL. So after this, we will only see GraphQL, um, say, language that Hasura uses. All the details can be found in the Hasura docs uh, and all the little details that are different from the GraphQL general specification can be found there. Okay, but what are we going to use on the front end? Well, in React, there is a really great package called Apollo uh, GraphQL. The Apollo has uh, a lot of features, but we uh, are going just going to use the front end part. And we're going to use uh, the components listed here. I'm not going to go into the details, but let's just say that you can go and uh, go to Google, uh, input Apollo GraphQL, and you will get a lot of documentations. You can create a server through Apollo. You can create a client in multiple languages, and uh, they're constantly working on improving these uh, packages. Okay, so let's go into the demo. Uh, also, if you want to check out the demo at some later time, here is the uh, URL. Uh, it's on GitHub. Check it out. It's going to be interesting. Okay. Problems here, but let's go into the demo. So here we have a uh, React application. We have a GraphQL client that is uh, created through Apollo. So we have a lot of imports here from Apollo. And we create a connector that is created here through a WebSocket. And we're going to communicate with the server only through the WebSocket. And we have to add some headers so that our front end connects to our back end with some security, at least a minimal amount. And that is this header here that uh, actually authenticates us as an admin on our uh, Hasura server. Uh, okay, let's pause here with the uh, front end. Let's see how the back end actually looks like. When we spin up this Hasura server, it looks something like this. It has its own console where we can test our queries. You can write a query in here, and you will get a result here. And you have to you can check out the data in the data tab. Uh, first, when you create a schema and tables, you will click here to add uh, those tables to this GraphQL server. And then you can see the data here. You can filter it here, let's say by hand. And you can define some other stuff in the settings section, like the allowed queries and uh, refresh your data from the database, the metadata if you've changed some columns or something like that. And also you have some actions or uh, remote schemas that can stitch two GraphQL uh, schemas into one on this server. Okay, and uh, here we have how our application actually, actually looks like. So it's a really simple application. 
where we have a list of to-dos, we can add a to-do, we can finish it, and we have uh, some notes that we can add to our to-do. So here we can add something, we can add that. We see it down here, it immediately uh, appeared. That's because we use subscriptions here. And when I check it, it goes away because I have checked this box here where we show only open to do's. If I uncheck this, we get it back here. Okay, and I can add a note. We save that. Okay, and how does that work uh, actually? Okay, we have our app, we add our page. Here we have some example pages. We'll go with that, through that in a minute. And we have our home page where we uh, can input some data. We can insert our uh, data. So here we pass a mutation query into a, a component. This component will then uh, use this mutation. So we are using webhooks here. Uh, we are using React hooks here. And uh, we use this mutation in this hook. And we can see this mutation is this one. So we have an insert to do. We uh, will return how many rows we've inserted and we'll return the data that we want to show on our UI. Okay. What else do we have here? We have a to-do list that will actually show our data. And that list will use a subscription. This subscription only gets uh, one parameter. Could get all our to-dos or just the ones that aren't finished. And this looks like this. So we here we can see an example of some, let's say, a dynamic way of creating a query. Uh, I have to note here that uh, Hasura doesn't have the um, directives implemented. So here I have to actually remove this part of the query to get this kind of dynamic uh, way of working. Okay. So, uh, this is the way this actually works. So the insert a query is executed when we here, and that executes uh, this mutation. So we just have the title. Okay. Uh, we can see this all this better on the example pages where we have uh, a list of queries and you can see how the query looks like and what are the results of that query. So in this example, we see the query is really simple. We just list some to-dos and we get all those to-dos back as a list, as an array. Okay, but we can do that with a related table and our Hasura server will return all the to-dos with a list of notes under that. Okay, we can also do counts, which are actually aggregates, and these aggregates can return some data and the actual aggregate that looks like this. So the nodes are actually the data that we're querying, and the aggregate will return in this case, account, you can also do a median in there or some averages or whatever you need. Okay, how do mutations look like? Well, uh, here we have examples of those. Okay, the insert one we already saw, but how can we insert multiple objects? Well, you can just pass in more uh, uh, objects. And in this example, we insert three to-dos, and we get all those three to-dos back in the data we defined in the mutation.
and also subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions can only get data from one table from your database, that is one schema part. So we can get uh, to-dos and notes separately, but we can get to-dos with notes. And we can see that oh, the only difference with this from the query is the subscription, subscription part. Okay, going back to the presentation. We have some links here that you can go into more depth about GraphQL and see where this technology is going. It's being used more and more often. And since my time is up, I'm thanking you for listening to my presentation. And thank you and goodbye. If you need something, feel free to contact me on my email here. Thank you for that, Dubrovko, which brings us to our final speaker of today's conference, who's a software engineer at GDIT. Her passion for web application development has led her to open source community to learn the full stack JavaScript. When she's not thriving off of coffee, meditation or travel, she builds cost effective, user friendly business applications. Let's welcome Moxie Hampton. Hi, everybody out there. Um, number one, let me say thank you so much to Shift Dev for putting this uh, conference together virtually. So it's very accessible to everybody. And I'm excited to have everybody here today. Hi, I'm Mo Hampton, um, a software engineer at General Dynamics IT. I currently build Microsoft applications for business use at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in the United States of America. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or on Instagram after this, or even in the chat with the live feed. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Moxie Hampton. The slide deck that we're viewing today was created by um, JavaScript, or Reveal.js. It's an HTML presentation framework, and it's hosted on slides.com. So feel free to check that out if you have any time. It's a nice presentation deck. And today's talk is going to be about giving back to tech without experiencing burnout. So you did it. You're a software engineer. After many hard hours of studying and learning difficult concepts, you made it through. Now you want to volunteer and give back to tech skills to a much needed cause. Exciting, right? Wait, first, here's a few tips to avoid uh, give a burnout before you start. In this talk, we will cover ways that you can continue to volunteer without spreading yourself too thin. Tips will include how do you give your talent without depleting your energy? Who should you volunteer for? What opportunities are available through GitHub on open source platforms? And how do you choose your projects with great impact? And lastly, how to say no. That would be a fun one. So giving back to the community is an act that is accomplished through volunteering. So givers are volunteers, essentially. People who choose a volunteer, they volunteer for a variety of many reasons. For some, it offers them a chance to make a difference in the community and directly impact the people around them. For others, it provides a opportunity to develop new skills and to build um, existing experiences or to just build off of your um, already their knowledge base. Regardless of your motivation, what unites them all is that they both find volunteerism and giving back challenging and rewarding. So according to an, uh, uh, excuse me, according to a Harvard Business Review article, it's called Beat Generosity Burnout. When givers don't protect themselves, their investments in others can cause them to feel overloaded, right? Fatigued. They fall behind on their work goals and face more stress and conflict at home. So generosity means caring more about others but it should not be at the expense of caring for yourself, right? By protecting yourself from exhaustion and giving yourself much needed breaks, you might feel less altruistic, but if you're not giving yourself those breaks and that much needed rest, you will end up in the long run, like burning yourself out. And who wants to do that? So the bottom line 
to avoid burnout at all costs, just do it. Try to avoid it. Let's look at the tips I'm going to give you. Because if you let the burnout affect you, it will affect all aspects of your life. I'm gonna give you more information on that here. So what is burnout? Um, burnout and volunteer burnout, they're just the same. They're pretty much like work-related burnout, only you're not getting paid to push through it. It manifests in different ways. It can be a physical or mental exhaustion, hopelessness, mood swings, and anxiety. Burnout also has been around, it's been around for a while, right? But now that we have a more fast paced lifestyle and we're digitally distracted with um, the social media things and then news being at your fingertips, it has amplified the problem of burnout. Essentially, voluntary burnout is when the stress and the guilt attacks you and your enthusiasm and your passion or what you came into volunteerism for in the first place, it starts to fade. Sometimes the cycle continues until you eventually quit your volunteerism role, or you just end up just volunteering or just not liking a volunteering idea at all. Ultimately, you start to decide the kind of thing, this is the kind of thing that might be for people who have more time, who are more organized than you, and you tend to fall back you start to doubt if you're really making a difference, which is really sad because all volunteerism really counts. You lose the satisfaction that you used to have. And where's the fun in all that? Why volunteer if you're gonna subject yourself to possible burnout? So here are a few ways that you can avoid the volunteer burnout. Make sure that you're doing consistently meaningful work. In the book, Uncovering Happiness by psychologist Elisha Goldstein, she explains how purpose keeps us away from that burnout and unhealthy habits that are associated with burnout. She states in her book, when you have a sense of purpose, you are likely to need the artificial boost you get from bad habits because you get a natural boost by connecting to the world in a meaningful way. So generally what she's saying there is whenever you don't feel like you're really connected to that cause, you start to burn out, then you might kind of trickle into other habits of like drinking more, smoking more, or just, you know, how we like to do sometimes, stay plopped up in front of your video games a little too long, where it's just unhealthy. What burns people out the most is not the doing the hard work. It's more of the ra rather that you feel like your work does not matter. Um, ensure that whatever you pick, you are excited about the cause and you are excited about the impact of it. You need to make sure that you have physical renewal, right? Some of those things, some people, they might be really well versed in CrossFit. That's their physical outlet or it might be that others like to run a 5K. I'm neither of those people, but for my last development team, I had a lead software engineer who was uh, really great in motivating me and keeping me on, on, on point with all my projects. But he would constantly tell us, or he would do it himself, to take a nature walk. It's something that's very low impact, but it would change how you would look at things and it would reduce your stress points. You just walk around for a little bit, take a breather and come back at it. I'm also an advocate for just basic meditation. Uh, generally, I like to get up in the morning and do that myself, but when I feel as if I'm being stressed out, it's also good to reconnect and just to take that moment and do a breathing exercise and kind of work your way through that. So that's a, a way to have that physical renewal. Also, you just wanna make sure that you have some regular exercising and you're at least enjoying nature. I know with the recent impacts of COVID and social distancing that a lot of us have been enjoying nature a lot more. We probably took it for granted in the past, but now we're using the opportunity to get out there, go on hikes, go powder boarding, go visit a lake, just safely, but fresh air and just getting your body moving a little bit more than what we used to prior to um, COVID. You wanna lean on your support network. What I mean by here is 
you want to do like an asthma check with them. It's asking your friends and your family if they notice a change in your behavior or how you are. If you're more withdrawn, if you're more stressed out, if you're starting to exhibit more habits or more um, traits of anxiety. Most times we don't notice that we're doing these things until somebody else will point it out for us. And then we'll start to be like, oh, you're right. This is the thing that's really in inflicted me a lot lately. Um, you want to ask others if they're willing to possibly help. Uh, discussions while you're having a nature walk, maybe you can combine these two things. Uh, they can help you with different ways or just be a resource to you whenever you need somebody to kind of filter and bounce off things off of them. Just ensure whatever you're doing that you're, like I said, taking breaks, making adjustments as needed, and just reevaluating so you can avoid that volunteer burnout. Um, another more social way to avoid giver burnout or volunteer burnout is to squat up. What I mean by squat up, squatting up means like your squad, your crew. You ask your friends and family to join you whenever you decide to volunteer. This way you can distribute the given load more evenly. It won't just be all 100% on you. And not only that, you can um, refer requests to people of your squad if they have the better time management or better skills than that. But when you're doing that, I mean, because we all have friends of different genders, make sure that you're not um, pushing more into the gender biases. Do not reinforce gender biases about who helps and how, right? Just be mindful of that. And I'll speak more about that shortly in another slide. But you can amplify your impact by looking for ways to include multiple people. So with a single act of generosity, you guys can do a group thing together. And how amazing would that be? We can chunk your time of giving together by days or blocks of time rather than sprinkling through the week. So a good example of chunking your time together is if you and your squad wanted to host a hackathon together, or you and your family members want to go and teach kids how to code. It's something that everybody can be introduced to. It's an easy feat and it won't be a long-term commitment, but it can be a short chunk of time that has a great impact. So when you squat up, you will feel more effective and more focused. As I mentioned, like I said before, uh, when you squat up and distribute responsibilities, be mindful of the gender biases. So in general, women shoulder responsibility for given acts that are the most valuable, but least visible, right? Like we tend to mentor and nurture behind the scenes a lot more and not get credit for it. Not that we're seeking for credit, but these are most time things that naturally um, come from women. We don't get that time back. I mean, we don't get that time back for our own work once we start to do that, professional development or opportunities to volunteer at higher visibility uh, initiatives. So that's taken away from us a little bit. So if you want to stop a little bit of the, uh, gender, the gender generosity burnout, we need to shift the balance a little bit. So for women, that means setting boundaries, being a little selfless at times, you know? Be an expert at the art of saying no, which we will talk about later. And I'll give you a little bit of tips on how to say no, but it's okay to say no. Just put that out there right now. So, Oh, I apologize. I realized that I've been sharing notes instead of the uh, presentation. So let's just go ahead and continue from here. So volunteering. So a few tips to avoid the give or burnout. Now, where do you start, right? First, ask if you'd rather volunteer in person or virtually due to COVID, if you want to remain uh, just doing a virtual volunteerism. Or you can even remain behind the curtain and contribute to open source. 
So here, as you see coming up on the slide deck now, is a couple of volunteering ways that you can do it. So if you want to do it in person, the great resource is to find a virtual opportunity through um, Volunteer Match right now. So volunteermatch.org is a, a resource that I used in the past to look for opportunities. Uh, when I used that, I found an opportunity with Start Small, Think Big, which is a business opportunity, which helps underserve uh, communities and business entrepreneurs, and they give them resources to start their own business for the first time. So I would go in as a web developer and help them set up their business accounts and their uh, web pages so they can get more outreach and eventually have the businesses come back to them. Um, you can search with the volunteermatch.org for their virtual location on there. You can also put in that what kind of volunteer role you want to be. If you want to be a web developer, if you want to be UX, UI, you want to focus on front end development, you're able to put those key terms in there and search for your opportunity. Um, and then the keywords, especially like your tech stack, whatever stack that you want to be able to place in there, you can do that also. Another great resource, for um, open source, if you're not going to do the volunteers in person or use a virtual through like volunteermatch.org, you can be able to do it through open source. The most popular um, platform, in my opinion, right now for open source would be using GitHub. In this talk, I'll talk about a few ways that you can leverage GitHub for your open source contributions. So you might ask yourself, why should I contribute to open source? There are organizations right now that are helping to accelerate tech for good by connecting developers who want to make a change with communities and nonprofits. So they're linking up people who really desperately need the technologists and the assistance through the developers and the coders and the people who have the skills through open source. For example, a couple of organizations that are great at this would be uh, one is Code for America, which focuses on local issues, uh, shared experiences like natural disasters, and they foster coll collaboration through that. So uh, one would be when Hurricane Katrina happened, Code for America was a big one uh, down in Louisiana to help connect in some of the developers and use their skills for good. Another one uh, that's more globally is Social Coder. It's a UK-based one that brings together volunteers and charities, but it does open source projects and nonprofits over across six different content, continents, which is amazing, right? So why not volunteer your talents as a developer uh, to an effort that needs them and continue to contribute to open source at the time? And for the icing on top, the Linux Foundation and DICE job support, it shows that there's a demand for open source professionals and it's increasing. So one of the things that's really major right now, about 89% of hiring managers, they say it's difficult to find open source talent, right? So you can build up your skills by using open source at the same time while you're volunteering. Not only that, 60% of companies are looking for open source full-time hires. And Lastly, in the next six months, they expect an increase of 67% of hiring open source professionals. So while you're making a social impact, you can also sharpen your skills and open source for future opportunities. I mean, open source contributions, ultimately, they add value to your career, right? Why not do it that way? Um, next, I'll just walk you through a few resources to assist with contributing on GitHub. So here we have um, opensource.org. I've learned about opensource.org from Brian Douglas, and he's a developer advocate at GitHub. He's very phenomenal at what he does. He's uh, passionate about making sure that people know how to access uh, open source through GitHub, of course. And he's always very welcoming and there to help you out if you need any help, if you haven't, you need some assistance. But one of the things that his team had put together is this website called opensource.org. And it's a great website because it will help you understand from start to finish, you can learn how to run and contribute an open source project for the community. So it kind of breaks it down to more bite-sized pieces so you know how to contribute. 
it democratizes the accessibility of open source. It makes it for everybody. If you need somewhere to start, I suggest you start here. And if you get stuck, I suggest that you go ahead and talk to Brian. <laughs> As I mentioned him earlier, he's a great point of contact at, at GitHub. He's very accessible if you need to talk with him. Um, if you ever need any help, don't hesitate to contact him on Twitter or GitHub. And his handle is at D, uh, B Dougie, yo, B Dougie, yo. <laughs> Another resource, a great resource for um, your open source projects is firstissue.dev. And it's a very, very simple um, website that will help you and assist you with your first contribution. It's, it will help you sort, sort through GitHub by issues and by language. So you can find it and you can scroll through good first issue and see what you feel comfortable with. We're trying it out. And that is a, a great place to start too. Now, one thing that I always recommend for everybody else is my favorite, as this is where I started with open source myself, was to just go as a newbie to Hacktoberfest by DigitalOcean. Now, Hacktoberfest is open globally. It's a global community. It's for everybody to be involved and uh, try their contributions and to help out with open source. Uh, pull requests can be made in any GitHub uh, repository or project. And you can sign up at any time between October the 1st to October 31st. The only requirement is that you register up and that you have about, I think it's four, yeah, four pull requests between that time frame. And the best thing about it is once you do that, you and you learn, you will build your community, you will learn and, and uh, connect with other very talented developers. And then once you do that, you can win a free shirt. I mean, we all love free swag, right? So you get a free shirt out of it at the end. So um, what's the next one? We have open source resources is the codetriage.com is next. For developers that are a little bit more experienced in open source, codetriage.com is a great resource to help find and track your projects. But what I mean by find and track is it helps you by picking a handful of open issues and delivering them to your inbox. So you'll get a daily uh, reminder of these are the open things. You can do daily, weekly, however you feel is best suited for you, but it'll keep you on track with the open um, issues out there in GitHub. But the great thing about Cotriage, it has kind of like a built-in mechanism that to help you avoid volunteer burnout, right? So if you get too busy with other competing priorities, Cotriage has an algorithm bit, built in that helps to back off the issue, right? So now you have a time frame, it will kind of pull back the issue for you so you don't feel overwhelmed with it. Right now, Code Triage has a heavy focus on healthcare, emergency response, and related open source projects. So if you see on their um, front page that I'm displaying here, their main concern right now, or at least their focus on highlighting, is trying to smash COVID. So if you're interested in, in volunteering in that, that would be great. So I have provided ways to find your next volunteer project, right? And tips to avoid the burnout during the process. If you think that you already have full blown case of a volunteer burnout, there are some steps you can take to get through it. First, you want to identify and accept your current situation. Give yourself a break. Examine the reasons why this happened. Review how you spend your time and just make those necessary adjustments. And again, you want to use those tips that I mentioned earlier of just like physical renewal, leaning on your friends and your family, and just really taking a break and stepping away from it before you truly burn yourself out 100% from volunteerism and you start to affect other aspects of your life. Most of all, you need to learn how to say no, right? So just to say no, it might be easier said than done. But here's a few tips to help you with saying no. One, um, make peace with how you're feeling and if you're comfortable with doing it. If you're not comfortable with doing it, don't feel obligated to follow through with it. Make sure that you're at peace with um, your contributions to that. 
if your contributions or your um, limit is you're saying, I only want to do one volunteer effort a year, that's fine. Stick with it. If you're saying, I only want to do, I can do up to five or six. Just make sure whatever that limit is that you set to make yourself comfortable, you stick with that and don't go back on it. Keep in mind that you don't say yes just because you keep, you're simply, excuse me, keep in mind not to say yes, just because you're simply capable of doing the task at hand. Again, going back to those uh, steps of avoiding volunteer burnout, make sure that it's not something that is going to exhaust you. Make sure that you have the time available for it and that you have meaningful work, that it has a great impact to you and you're looking forward to the impact that it has to the community. Because if you're not passionate about it, you're more susceptible to burnout sooner. And then also never say yes on the spot. Make sure you give that time to really think through it. Remember that allowing others to step up is by you saying no. So if you say no, you're giving an opportunity to somebody else to say yes and to ex exert their developer skills and to be able to help out. You know what works best for you and nobody else does. So commit to what you can and say no to what you can. Uh, this one was hard for me in the beginning. Uh, at first, when I uh, ramped up my developer skills, I wanted to get out there and I wanted to volunteer for every single organization that made me excited. But don't schedule every waking moment of your time with tech. Tech is not, and it cannot be, your entire life. Make sure that you're avoiding burnout by giving yourself other hobbies and other things to do outside of it. Although there is a great impact when you volunteer, you can't volunteer if you haven't taken care of yourself. And lastly, just stop comparing yourself to other tech influencers. I know there's a lot of influence out, influencers out there that are doing great things, but that is not necessarily your track. Do what is best for you. I know that's like a resonating thing. I keep saying that over and over again. So that's it for me on the talk. I apologize for the beginning of seeing the notes and not the slides. You guys missed out on some great slides. But if there are any questions for me in the chat, I would love to answer them. So feel free to ask me anything. I can even look at it right now. I think we're good right now in the chat. I'm not seeing any additional questions there. Thank you for that, Moxie. Now that brings us to the end of another Shift Remote Conference. Have you had a good day? Let us know there in that chat. It'd be great to hear from you. Um, and it'd also be great to see you again. Our next conference, those that haven't yet registered, is on the 16th, so just a couple days from now. Do check out our website. It's got all the details on there where we'll be talking a bit more about the web. So to wrap up today, remember the hashtag shift remote. Put those photos up in social media so that we know that you've been here. And once again, a huge thank you to our supporters and our sponsors at Microsoft, Infobit Autodesk, Microblink Barrage, Azure Idea, ICT, Japania, Venture, Pseudocode, 5, Ars Futura, Nanobit, Infinium Q, Nine Dots, Get By Bus, Aspira, Code Anywhere, Pluggy, and Neto Krasija. Without you, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you to them. And also thank you from us here at the Shift Conference. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye.